the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. For the past few weeks, we have been following the story of David's meteoric rise to become the king of Israel. His ascension has been quick, cunning, heroic, and costly. Starting as a lowly and rough shepherd, and then becoming a revered and polished king, is quite a magnificent rags to riches story. He came into power with a lot of expectations and praise, as Samuel described him as a man after God's own heart a man who would follow God's ways, unlike his predecessor, Saul. But that's the thing about David. He was still a man, still a human, and still imperfect. Second Samuel 11 tells the story of David's rape of Bathsheba. For some, it may be difficult to stomach the idea that one of Israel's heroes, the king who united two kingdoms of Judah and Israel together, would commit a horrific injustice. But this is a story that we see get played out time and time again. It is interesting that this story is left in scripture as it could have been left out to maintain the image of David as Israel's hero. Yet I think that those who wrote, edited, and compiled the Hebrew scriptures chose to keep the rape of Bathsheba and the murder of Uriah fit in as it fits in with the broader goals of the authors, the Deuteronomists. So before we get into it, just a little Bible history lesson. The Deuteronomists are commonly accepted to be responsible for writing and editing the books of Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings, and Jeremiah. These books all tell the story of Israel from its establishment in the Promised Land up until its fall to the Assyrians and later Babylonians. The Deuteronomists started to write these books in 586 BCE, well into the Babylonian captivity and, ex and exile. So they are looking back on their people's history, trying to make sense of how they got to this situation. So the two key views that the Deuteronomists have are one, they viewed the history of their people as being directly linked to their faithfulness to God. So their successes and failures were a result of their faithfulness, which brings success, or disobedience, which brings failure. And their second main view is that there is a special concern for the poor, widows, and the fatherless. All Israelites are brothers and sisters, or sis and sisters and each one will answer to God for their treatment of their neighbor. So the story of David and Bathsheba explores these two views quite well. David is a king. He has power, which can be used for both good and bad. Last week, we read about his desire to direct Israel's resources and labor to build a temple for God. This week, Israel's resources are being used to wage a war at David's orders. David is well aware of his power and he can use and how he can use it and deploy it. When he saw Bathsheba, he made a choice to deploy his power to harm her. Bathsheba was not given an invite that she could reject or accept. Instead, David sent his messengers to bring her to him. After David learns that Bathsheba is pregnant, he knows that his corrupt use of power will be exposed. Instead of coming clean, he again decides to use his power to try and bury the situation. David asks that Bathsheba's husband be brought home from the war, again demanding and moving people from the comfort of his palace. He tries to get Uriah to sleep with Bathsheba as an, as an attempt to cover his tracks, but Uriah rejects and refuses David's comfort. In a final bid, David gets Uriah drunk, hoping that he will come home to Bathsheba, but all this ultimately fails. Uriah refuses to abandon his responsibilities as a soldier during the time of war. And at the end of the narrative, Uriah is the victim of a plot to stage a battlefield death. Uriah the Hittite displays considerable character beyond that of King David. Bathsheba's narrative has no power at all in these events. 
She is only named once, and even though this is her story, and it's her life, she only speaks once. Bathsheba is left to deal with her shame and humiliation as she bathes herself after her rape to purify herself from the defilement. David also never speaks to Bathsheba directly, which reduces her personhood. For David, Bathsheba is subordinate and only an object and a subject to him. And the only words that she says to to David and that she says in the story are to announce her pregnancy. We can imagine Bathsheba's fair disgrace and sorrow, even though she was powerless through all of these events. The story of David and Bathsheba explores the dynamics of power and moral corruption. David exploits and manipulates his power to achieve his ends. As king of Israel, the power he has is God-given, further showing how deeply corrupt his power, his actions were. He orders Uriah's murder after his coercive attempts to cover up his actions are resisted by Uriah. David's actions may seem isolated to this story, but the first line of the chapter hints towards his pattern of how he deploys his power. In the spring, quote, in the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, end quote, David has made war a routine for the kingdom of Israel. And as we will read next Sunday, David's actions do not go without consequence. This story is a formative event in David's royal career as these two mistakes, the rape of Bathsheba and the murder of Uriah, bring, down, bring on a downward spiral for David, which he ultimately does not recover from. But for this week, we are left to wonder, what is it about power that leads to corruption and acts of injustice? What does it mean that a man after God's own heart can be the villain of the story? This text is challenging to deal with for a variety of reasons. Rape is not an easy or pleasant topic, but it is something that many people unfortunately experience. A state-ordered execution is requested by a heroic figure in Christian tradition. David's morally corrupt actions and the fear it created. All right, so again, we come back to the question that was, I posed at the beginning. Why would the Deuteronomists keep this story in Scripture? The events of the story of David and Bathsheba show the levels of that failure, the levels of failure that we can reach when we are not faithful to God. To be faithful to God means to live our lives as God has guides us to. God guides us to love others and respect their dignity. And in this story, David fails to be faithful to God as he violates Bathsheba and commits murder. His use of power is not to benefit others as God would want. The patterns in this story are repeated repeatedly throughout history. And the Deuteronomists understood this, and they used the story of David and Bathsheba to contextualize their own people's history. David was certainly not the only king who used his power correctly. In fact, most of his descendants who ruled over Israel and Judah were actually pretty corrupt. So in trying to make sense of their world, the Deuteronomists saw that power and the corrupt, and the corruption that it leads to, leads to, the, to disaster for society. And that's what's challenging, and that's what challenging texts in the Bible help us to see. We can look more closely at our own world and see what the patterns that are, that are there and what patterns continue to be perpetuated, that continue to cause harm, use and use violence and destruction. We're able to better call out when power is used to exploit, coerce, or silence. When we look out into the world, we are better able to point to God's grace and offer a different way of being, a way of love that seeks to use power to liberate and to uplift. We make sense of situations of injustice like Palestine and climate change and the disaster it creates, and become more emboldened to call out leaders who deploy their power for exploitation, 
destruction, and violence, and those who continue to perpetuate injustice. And in doing so, we give the Uriahs and Bathshebas in our world a voice that we stand, and as we stand alongside them in their resistance. So let's not make our world to be like one of the one of the psalmists, where everyone is corrupt and God is unable to find a good person among us. Instead, let us create a world where God can look down from heaven and be pleased that we are faithful. Amen.